Hello and welcome to Let's Talk, a series of podcasts produced by the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation on the issues that matter to us and the issues that we know matter to you as well. Substance use disorders, prevention, treatment, research, and recovery support. I'm your host, William Moyers, and we come to you today. We're on the road from the Betty Ford Center in Rancho Mirage, California, with three distinguished guests today who have been walking that walk for a long time now. We have Hermano, June, and David. Welcome. Thank Thank you, you. William. We want to talk today about long-term recovery. So often in the field of addiction treatment, we often focus on the disease, or we talk about what treatment is. It's not oftentimes we get a chance to have three people who've been walking the walk talking about recovery and the reality that um, uh, treatment is just really the beginning of the long journey. Armano, how long have you been walking this walk now? I came to Betty Ford in uh, April of 2003 and I stayed here for three months. So I left the treatment in July of 2003. June? I came here September 28, 2006, and I left here uh, after 55 days, and it was the day before Thanksgiving. And David, how long have you been walking the walk from here? Uh, I came here on St. Patrick's Day of 2005, and uh, I was here till June 19th of 2005. Thank you for disclosing that. Um, Tell me, what has been the biggest surprise, Hermano, for you since you left here in terms of your own journey? I heard when I was in treatment that uh, addiction would have uh, eventually become an opportunity. And I thought it was marketing. I thought it was uh, an excellent way to try to uh, make people accept uh, defeat. And uh, the the most surprising and pleasant uh, afterthought was that I realized how true the opportunity is. Uh, I never thought I would reach to a point where I would assume that addiction was the blessing for my life. So from adversity comes opportunity. Yes, yes. June, what did you expect when you walked out of the Betty Ford Center? I don't know that I had any expectations. I had hopes um, that I would get my family back because Mm. I lost my family um, before I came here. And um, I really what happened was I got myself back here and then I got my family back. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, was the, that was the biggest uh, um, challenge for me was to win the trust back because mm-hmm. I had lost that. Their trust in you. Their trust in me. Mm-hmm. Because I felt good that from the moment I walked through the Betty Ford Center, I, um, I, although I wasn't a model patient, I actually was <laughs> on that road of recovery mm-hmm. and I have never looked back. David, when you, uh, came in here on St. Patrick's Day a long time ago now. You said 2005, was it? Well, what was your expectation of what treatment was going to be, and how did that jibe with what happened to you after you left here? I was fearful. Um, I thought that I was going to come to treatment and learn how to live without substances. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that what I got was uh, this amazing life, and I left with some fear, still some healthy fear, but I was also really excited because they gave me a plan. I had a great case manager, and the case manager gave me an aftercare plan. I was connected with uh, somebody from the alumni department in my area who I called and connected with right away when I got home, and um, I hit the ground running. Hmm. Armando, what about you, though? You, you, did you struggle when you got out of here, or did you find it to be easy? Um, I anticipated it to be very hard, and I'm very happy I did that because it kept my guard very high. Hmm. And uh, I didn't uh, do, uh, I didn't leave anything undone from the recommendation. You know, earlier I said that to me addiction revealed itself as being an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I was very concerned that I would lose my creative edge. I always thought that uh, my iconoclastic, creative, artistic way was rooted in the use of drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And instead I realized that indeed it was the opposite. After fearing to lose all my artistic friends because they were all users, that revealed to be a false problem. I instantly connected with new people and the creativity is all there. Really, for me, recovery delivered everything that addiction had promised. It was, uh, I didn't have to change my way of thinking. I just found a better, way to access what I always wanted. So it's easy to be 
creative without the substances. Well, uh, have you ever written a, a script overnight on, on a cocaine stupor and read that <laughs> the next morning? <laughs> it's no good. No. <laughs> June, so many people who uh, come to, go to treatment or come to treatment at the Betty Ford Center here come from long distances, but you literally just had to come a couple of miles, right? Yes. Yeah, I live 10 minutes from here, and th that was a blessing and a challenge. I, I do know that um, God had a plan for me, and that was to live in this area so that it was uh, the Betty Ford Center was close for when I needed it. Um, but the challenge was that I was on a restraining order when I was a patient here, and um, that um, was really a challenge because uh, I couldn't see my children or communicate with them, and somebody else was taking care of them as I was here with my little card at the, the uh, grocery store getting my groceries for me. And so that was really, really difficult. And uh, it was my brother that said, um, would you go to any lengths? And he's not in the program. Mm -hmm. And um, and that helped uh, helped me to stay and to, to, to go through it. Yeah. David, what has been the, 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 the greatest w wisdom that you've gleaned from this long walk of yours now? What, what is it that you've grabbed onto and held onto? Being of service. Tell, talk no, more no about question. that service. Be being of service was something that I watched other people do growing up. Um, my mom was involved in doing a lot of volunteer work, other family members, and um, yet it wasn't something I had connected with until I, my road to recovery began. And I, I quickly realized how much I was getting out of it when I was giving. Um, I've been able to connect a lot with the Betty Ford Center as well as doing some other service work, and it's just, um, I get a glow from it. Well, it's all three magical. of you. It's magical. It's That's magical. what a lot of people mm -hmm. say. And, and all three of you have never been very shy about uh, standing up and speaking out and revealing your own journeys. You've all, well, here you are, you know, sharing in this uh, Let's Talk podcast. But as a person in recovery and now as a person in long-term recovery, how do you experience the needs of other people? In other words, surely others have come to you and sought counsel. Yes, Hermano? Yes, yes. And... Uh, um, it's a very strange, somebody defines our way to recovery as self-help. And I find that very misleading in a way, because certainly I cannot really help myself. And, but I attract what I'm ready for, and I can prime myself to attract something in line with my desire and what's good for me. Uh, so I, the, this relationship with Sponsee or other people in the program, or family member that uh, just uh, are in your life, uh, takes a turn for the better, and all of a sudden you go from being a pariah to being a revered opinionist. You know, it's wonderful. <laughs> June, you um, you went right back into the community where you'd been actively using, and certainly lots of people knew mm -hmm. how you used to be. Was that hard to step back into the same arena, um, so close? to where you know, you'd been using it so close to treatment? I actually didn't really step back into the arena. What happened oh. for me was um, I had reached a deep level of um, introspection and um, re revealing of myself that I couldn't do the small talk when I first got sober. And so I chose to, to not uh, go back to my job, which is uh, I'm in the restaurant business, mm -hmm. and um, I just couldn't do that small talk. So it was then my choice to take some time away and to um, spend time on um, building my sobriety and building the trust back in my family. David, did you step right back into your career, or how did you manage that interaction between leaving here in those early days? early months and even those early years in recovery with your profession? That's a really good question. I was unemployed <laughs> oh. and um, I was unemployable when I got here and I went back and I had to kind of search out what I wanted to do and one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to move from the Los Angeles area out here to the desert because I found that I could remain connected and stay sober. So while I came out here um, I figured out what I wanted to do. I actually work in recovery now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it's a wonderful thing. They talk about people, places, and things, mm -hmm. and the, the, the reality that it, in long-term recovery, or even in those early days especially, we have to change a lot of things about our lives as it relates to people, places, and things. How difficult was that for you, Armando? Well, there is an endemic resistance to change that I think is rooted deeply in, uh, 
in the domain of my disease that makes me believe that uh, change is uncomfortable. But at the same time, every time that I evolved, it was due to the fact that uh, I've been confined to a, a, an uncomfortable setting. So uh, sometimes I negotiate with my disease. You know, my disease mm -hmm. says things to me like, uh, <clears throat> you are late, don't go to the meeting, or those steps are archaic language. And I say, okay, you guys have a point there, but as long as you express that, I go anyway, and I work the steps anyway. So I had to sort of, uh, uh, in, a, in a strange form of controlled schizophrenia, address each part of my personality. <laughs> June, you did take a break from the restaurant business, but ultimately you went back to, mm -hmm. and I know I'm biased here, and this is not an advertisement for Jillian's, but it's a great restaurant, not too far from where we're sitting right now. Interesting. The best, yes, David. How did you decide when and how to return to the business or to the industry? Uh, it was in God's time, and uh, it came in the way of a, a staff member that had taken some a leave of absence and um, and couldn't come back in time, and I had to go back to work. Um, it was uh, wasn't really a choice on my part. I, the job needed to be done. And when I went back to work, I, I realized that that's where I needed to be at that time. And was it hard? It wasn't. No, it wasn't. I mean, I was still doing things behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. And by that time, it was two and a half years. So I was really very firmly rooted in, um, in the uh, AA recovery unit. And also, I was coming back here. I, I didn't leave the center and not come back. I left and I would come back on Monday night for therapeutic aftercare. I brought my children here on Wednesday evenings for their aftercare because both of them went through uh, the programs that are mm -hmm. offered here, the family mm -hmm. program and the children's program. My husband went through the family program three times. So um, I have support from my family and, um, and I think being open about my sobriety has helped me as well because um, I'm able to be of service and also um, I don't have a secret anymore. Right, right. And addiction is an illness of isolation with a lot of secrets, and exactly. the antidote to it is togetherness and sharing, exactly. and giving back. And David, you've been—you talked about it earlier. You, you, you've given back. How important is it as people in long-term recovery to help other addicts and alcoholics along the journey? I think it's really important. I, I mean, I place it up there with um, my connection to to a power greater than myself. Um, I think the way that I can t spread love to other people and the way to get the message out is through service work. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I was blessed with, like I mentioned earlier, was this aftercare plan that I got from here. And I know it's not one size fits all and your mileage may vary. However, I was um, desperate enough when I got here that when I left I was willing to take some direction. And when they told me to, to get to meetings and get a sponsor and work the steps and do service work, I threw myself in and the Betty Ford Center also had gentlemen that had come here before me and they were the ones that passed that to me and I've been able to pass that along to others through them. Do you help other addicts and alcoholics? Yes, but uh, I, for a long, for, in the beginning I thought that helping others was uh, out of altruism and other out of uh, <clears throat> giving back, I thought it was rooted in value for uh, reciprocate gift received. I had the whole, uh, I had the whole uh, concept that was probably conditioned by my religious upbringing. And uh, I realized while practicing it that it's not like that at all. Helping others is really a vital function for me. I'm really very selfish when I do that. Although reluctantly sometimes, never fails to better my life. So once I got uh, contaminated with the virus of service, I gladly embraced it. Does that work for you too, June? I remember when I, one of the first times I met you, I, I believe it may have been at the restaurant or at the front door, you were at the front, wherever it was. And do you find that people gravitate to you um, asking for help or for counsel or insights, knowing that you know what you know? I do, I do. I feel, well, being open and sharing and, um, and not having a secret, um, I think has, um, has been valuable in, in having people feeling comfortable uh, coming forward and asking for help. Mm -hmm. uh, I love being of service and um, it's, it's what keeps me sober.
in the interest of full disclosure, I think I can say that none of us in here is under the age of 30. So, um, and I'm not, I'm not violating anybody's confidentiality, but I'm just saying, so we're all people who've been walking this walk for a long time and we're also getting older <laughs> as we tend to do. Uh, whether you're in recovery or not, you get older. David, what has been the biggest challenge for you as you have begun to age in recovery? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I, Physically, I, mentally, emotionally, financially? Um, I, honestly, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head because things, everything is, in my life has improved. I would mm -hmm. say where maybe the biggest challenge has come in, where I've also been able to overcome that, has been the relationship with my 27-year-old son. Explain more about that, please. Okay. Um, it used to be when I would speak to him, I would try to be controlling and tell him what to do and direct him. and he didn't really want to listen too much and now I just listen and, uh, and then I ask him if he would like some feedback. Uh, sometimes he says yes, sometimes not so much, but now, you know, he calls every day to check in and see how I'm doing and, and that's been a blessing to be able to be there for him mm -hmm. and, and be a man and be an example. Um, that he can look up to. And June, you've talked about too, the restoration of the family dynamic. Um, yeah, I did want to share something. Um, <clears throat> my oldest daughter got a tattoo me when she was 18 years old, which was, uh, I was uh, four years sober at that time. She was 14 when I got here. She was the one that was most affected by the disease. And um, so she got this tattoo and I found out about it on Facebook and I was really upset mm. in the beginning when I saw it. And, um, and then I realized, wow. So the, the tattoo is on her rib cage and it has the word serenity and my sobriety date. Mm. And, um, and so I got all puffy and, you know, and, and so I called her and, and mm -hmm. I said, uh, Jillian, I'm so honored that you would put my sobriety date on your body. And she said, Mom, get over yourself. She said that day was when we could all uh, begin to breathe. So when I got sober, um, it didn't change my life. It, my life, it changed the life with the people that, mm -hmm. that surround me. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Hermano, what, what, in your journey, what, what's, what's been the biggest challenge all these years later? Well, it is uh, still a challenge. It's uh, complacency. I, my, uh, complacency? Yes. Hmm. My disease is learning everything I learn. And uh, every now and then, I become certain of something. And every time I have a certitude, my disease loves it because I stop learning right there and then. So to keep this fresh, to keep this challenging, to know that I will change my mind for sure, no matter how much I believe what I believe today, and maintain uh, an attunement with that type of evolution that keeps happening, Sometimes it's, uh, it's challenging because I rather know what's going on and be in control of the situation. It's a big delusion. <laughs> so I get reminded of that. And uh, it's a at the same time, it's a challenge as well as a great reminder. David, what about the, um, all these years later? Do you ever find yourself contemplating a drink or a drug or is that obsession long gone? I have to say the obsession was removed a long time ago, but thoughts come all the time. I could be um, sitting in a restaurant and see something pretty go by on a tray and think about it, but very quickly the recovery part of my brain kicks in immediately because I know that it's not something that I can do today. You could be sitting in a restaurant, but June, you're working in one, mm -hmm. and the hospitality business, the restaurant business is one that oftentimes emphasizes alcohol. Mm -hmm. Is that hard for you to be around it? Do you ever find that moment when you? No. Uh, no, I have my dinner at the bar every night mm -hmm. and uh, the bottles are there, but I just don't see them anymore. Um, like David, the obsession was removed a long time ago. I believe that the obsession was removed the day I walked through the doors here. The day you surrendered. Mm -hmm. I did, I yes. surrendered. Um, and like David, I, you know, there, there, sometimes there may be something that will jog a memory, like there was a bottle of, um, uh, vermouth that somebody had left in my guest house and uh, it brought back memories of um, drinking that when I was a t you know a teenager in in Scotland where I grew up and um, you know there was that fleeting thought of what it tasted like but I cannot romance that and I know that and so I got rid of the bottle and took it to my restaurant we'll pour it there <laughs> so um, 
being being in recovery, uh, it is one day at a time, and um, and I live in that day mm -hmm. of um, uh, try to anyway living living in the sunshine of the spirit, mm -hmm. and staying connected, and being of service and going to meetings, having a sponsor, all of the things that are suggested. Um, or were suggested to me when I was first sober, I practice today still. Hermano, do you ever get that fleeting ping of maybe just one line or one drink? Of course, of course. And every time they say I have to do a surgery, I kind of uh, become very interested in that. Right, because uh, of the threat of pain medication. Yes, yes, yes. But you know, really drugs and alcohol were never my problem. My problem was this delusion of wanting to fix myself or being capable of doing something to implement my state. And that delusion persists today on other aspect of my life. Sometimes it's just uh, um, um, going to dinner with somebody I don't know and imagine this, uh, I, I start uh, fantasizing about naming our grandchildren before I get there. <laughs> or sometime it is like to stop at the mall on my way home to buy something I don't need with money I don't have to impress people who don't care, you know? It's, uh, it's, you uh, it's from hard that too. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. It's hard to, it, it morphs, it adapts right. to recovery. Yes, and I think that's a really interesting point. You all have each touched on it, but so many of us crawl into treatment or find our bottom and think that we need to stop using. And of course we need to stop using because we have a baffling inability to just say no. But what we discover further down the road, do we not, that this is much more, uh, recovery is much more than just not drinking. Right, yes. David? David, what is it? What is it? It's more than not drinking. What is it? God, it, to me, it's again, it's a spiritual connection to something that I didn't have before. Mm. It's, um, it's knowing that things are going to be okay. It's, it's a lessening of the fear in my life. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a growth of being able to take people in and, and, uh, and be helpful as mm -hmm. much as I possibly can. You still have those challenges. Fear is part of being human, right? Oh, Anger sure. is part oh, of being sure. human, Absolutely. shortcomings. But you better, you have the tools to deal with it. Absolutely. William, I've been through divorce. I've had financial problems. There's been legal issues. Uh, money comes and goes. And, and um, there's relationship things that, that happen as well. Uh, people die. Um, there's a lot that goes on. That's life in session. And everybody deals with that. I just don't have to deal with it and get high mm -hmm. anymore. June, you mean it's not a end of the rainbow when you go to treatment it's not the end of the rainbow no no i thought it was mm -hmm. um and like i said before i came here with the um the the hopes of getting my family back and um you know i found it i mean i didn't know that i could live without uh alcohol uh i didn't know that i could live without meth uh but i can and um and life is uh i, I is so beautiful today uh i have such a beautiful life and I'm so grateful for it and I think that's one of the things that um, helps me is to remain grateful. We have about a minute before we have to wrap this up and it's too bad we could go on for an hour here this is very powerful but I want to touch I want to give each of you an opportunity to speak directly to the newcomer and by the newcomer I mean somebody who's listening to this or watching this who wants what each of you has which is years beyond that last drink or drug. There is a reason why they say a day at a time, and a day at a time does add up after a while. But Ermana, we'll, we'll start with you. What, what would be your concluding message to somebody out there who isn't struggling with substances? They've actually made it in the door, literally or figuratively, but they're struggling with what's next. What's your message for them? Well, um, obviously, being in recovery improves my present time. And uh, by doing that, it'll most likely better my future as well. But what I find very remarkable is it also fixes my past. And what I mean by that is I have an opportunity to use every bad experience I had, every unnecessary suffering I caused to myself and others, turns into an asset for redemption mm -hmm. because it gives me ground to help somebody that is going through the same thing. So all that devastating uh, uh, shame and guilt ridden memory of my life, all of a sudden gets used and comes to fruition because through that, I can, uh, through helping others, I can gain redemption. That uh, mm. it's, uh, mm. it's very uh, nice to feel. David, to those out there today who are counting days or even counting weeks or months, 
What's your message? What's your message of hope to them? My message of hope to them is, first of all, a plea for them to stick around, uh -huh. for them to stay. No matter what's going on in their life, stay with us. Come and arm wrestle over your issues and tell us why it may not be working for you. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down, I'm going to love them unconditionally, be as patient as I possibly can, and let them know that there's an amazing life out there for them, that it changes significantly, it becomes different. There's more than, uh, than meets the eye. And that's what attracted me, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I continue to stay. If I get connected and stay connected, I get another day. Mm -hmm. June? Yes, I would say the same thing, and I would also say that um, work the steps. Work the steps uh, that are in the big book and um, get a sponsor to help you with that, somebody that you can be accountable to, and, um, and just keep coming back. Um, or I, I like to say, don't keep coming back, just stay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because uh, the answers are here, and we'd rather have you inside the fellowship than outside the fellowship and uh, we're here to help. Um, I love being of service. Uh, it really does, it is the bright spot of my day. And uh, uh, it's just one day at a time. And it isn't easy, it's not easy, but it, uh, it is simple. And it sure beats the alternative. It sure beats the alternative, mm -hmm. yes. June, thank you for sharing, hermano. Thank, thank you, you for sharing your strength and wisdom today. And David, thanks to you too for reminding us about the importance of giving back to others. Each of you is a shining example of the fact that a day at a time does add up to weeks and months and years and that you can do, as you said, take that adversity and turn it around and into the opportunity that each of you has shown and shared with us today in your own experiences. Thank you all very much for joining us today and standing up and speaking out uh, not on the problem, but certainly on the solution, recovery, long-term recovery, a day at a time. Thank I'm you, your Thank you. host, Thank you. William Moyers. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Let's Talk here on the campus of the Betty Ford Center. Join us again when we talk about the issues, not just around the problem, but also the solution. Thank you.